Uh, thanks a lot, Alphonse and Alex, for inviting me to talk. And let's see here. So we'll talk about it, laparoscopic gastric plication. Uh, and do I hit the mouse here? Okay, and these are my disclosures. I should point out the two studies that we did at the Cleveland Clinic on plication were sponsored by Ethicon Endosurgery. And hopefully I've pointed that out uh, multiple times in our slide set here. So there is a conflict there that I'm disclosing. Otherwise, there's no relevant disclosures. We're going to talk about just briefly the concept of plication. If you're not familiar with it, <coughs> briefly talk about the different techniques that have been used. And I'll go over some of the clinical outcomes. There's really not much da data right now on, on mechanisms. Uh, or metabolic effects of plication, but I'll show you a couple small studies that have looked at that. This is a concept that came about in response to um, trying to find another way to create gastric volume reduction without stapling or placing a foreign body. And so as you can see here, we're really folding the stomach in. We've tried this in several different ways, as I'll show you for, uh, later in the talk. But this greater curvature plication involves taking down the greater curvature, just as you would with a sleeve, and folding that stomach in with several rows of sutures, uh, and potentially uh, creating a smaller gastric volume, tubularizing the stomach, if you will, and um, trying to create this uh, tubular stomach without a resection which has some appeal to patients uh, who aren't interested in the sleeve for that reason or don't want a foreign body or a bypass. Um, potentially has lower costs. Uh, initially, we thought this was going to be a leak-proof operation. As it turns out, it's not. Uh, um, we'll talk a little bit about complications later in the talk. This operation relies on the concept that if you sew serosa to serosa, you're going to get some fibrous reaction. And you can control that to some degree using different types of sutures or different types of fasteners. But ultimately, you when you want that serosal to serosal apposition in your full to maintain the durability of that uh, plication. And there's lots of different ways to perform this procedure or that have been used to perform this procedure. And that involves various suture types, suture patterns different spacing of the sutures. It's a very difficult operation to um, reproduce. It's, it's one of the challenges of this operation is that uh, it's hard to calibrate the size of the lumen because as I'll show you, it's a horseshoe shaped lumen. It's not a tubular lumen like you have with a sleeve. Regardless of how you end up doing it, this is how it's supposed to kind of look at, at the end. And what you have there is that horseshoe or omega shaped lumen with a large fold that occupies the majority of the lumen. Uh, as obviously, it's important not to overdo it. You'll obstruct or you'll have ischemia in that uh, fold that can potentially lead to a leak. And if you underdo it, and I'll show you some pictures of how patchless the volume of the stomach can get if you don't make it tight enough initially. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts of how we got there, how it was uh, started. And um, I'm going to show you some of the clinical outcomes. And I can tell you just within the last couple of weeks, this is an updated sort of literature search. And this is really the whole body of literature in terms of plication. There's not a lot out there. There's some mostly single center studies uh, with reasonable numbers and fairly short term follow up. But unless something's been published in the last couple of weeks, this is really, you know, it as far as plication in the literature. So one of the earlier, earlier studies by uh, Dr. Salas and uh, Chile was 100 patients with a fairly low BMI overall, 37 and a half. One year results with, you know, a good weight loss, good early weight loss of 69% uh, excess weight loss, really no major complications or uh, mortalities. Almino Ramos and his group in um, Brazil uh, published their initial experience of 42 patients with a mean BMI of 41. Again, it can be done in a short period of time, fairly short length of stay without major complications. And at 18 months, they had 62% excess weight loss. And you can see the upper GI there uh, representing this large space occupying fold within the uh, lumen of the stomach. So it looks unusual on an upper GI and often confuses our radiology colleagues when they go down for their upper GI tests. This is another study uh, out of Greece, more recently looking at uh, kind of two techniques. One of them simply just in captures that mid portion of the greater curve in their plication to help prevent seromas within the fold. Uh, regardless, it was done in a fairly short period of time, short length of stay. And uh, in this particular study, you can see the results there in their uh, chart from their table. But we're starting to see some, uh, f some incomplete weight loss or failure of weight loss. You can see about 6% of the folks had less than 30% excess weight loss and 21% had less than 50%. So as with any operation, when you're doing less, you're getting less invasive, you're going to see a wider distribution in how patients do, particularly the longer you follow them up. 
And you can see here that fold is still intact, but you've got a lot of surface area. You've still got a lot of volume long term in that stomach. And this is what we see in some of these folks who are starting to see their weight come back on as you get that compliance of the remaining stomach. And that fold is not enough to maintain some of this weight loss in these patients. And so we're seeing this wider bell-shaped curve with this operation than we do with some of the other more restrictive operations. The surgeon with the largest uh, experience in the world probably of plication is Dr. Talapur out of Iran. He uh, initially presented 150 patients uh, with a four-year follow-up, but a very small number of patients who had made it out to four years. But, you know, with that three to four-year mark, he's seeing 50 to 55 percent excess weight loss. Um, and then he subsequently just recently published a much larger series of 800 cases that uh, he had some follow-up out to 12 years. So this includes all the short-term and long-term follow-up with a mean excess weight loss of around 70 percent in the short term. And then it goes down to about 55 percent at five years. Uh, and then it, certainly as you get further out away from this operation, just like any bariatric operation, you're going to see uh, more weight loss failures. And at the long-term follow-up, about a third, a third of the patients were um, unhappy with their weight loss. Clearly it costs less, and this is a, certainly an issue, and the reason for its, some, its popularity in some areas of the world uh, costs less than the sleeve, the band, or the bypass. And it can still be done with uh, fairly low major complication rates, and this series had a 1% uh, reoperation rate due to either a perforation or an obstruction from that fold. There's really very little comparative data right now. I know there's um, some studies being done, and there are um, some studies in press or in, in manuscript review looking at some comparative trials with plication. This is all that's in the literature right now, which is a non-randomized small study looking at patients who underwent sleeve gastrectomy or gastric plication. Plication took a little longer, cost less, but uh, short-term results showed uh, inferior weight loss compared to the sleeve. And as you might expect, uh, less loss of hunger with the plication compared to the sleeve because it's not a resectional operation. We don't really know what's going on with ghrelin with this operation. I'll show you a rat study later, but I think that's a question that needs to be answered. And this is in diabetic patients. Again, there's not a lot of um, mechanistic, there's really no good mechanistic studies with the plication. So I, we can't really call this a metabolic procedure until we understand how it works and how it uh, may have weight uh, independent effects on some of these metabolic conditions. Um, this is the only study that I could find that looked specifically at a group of uh, diabetic patients. And this is short-term follow-up, just 55 patients with a mean age of 38, a BMI of 43, mean A1C of around 8 preoperatively. Uh, and if you look at their weight loss results, it's not, it's not fantastic. In fact, it's not even consistent with what other studies have reported. This is 12-month data with 35% excess weight loss and a lot of uh, stalling of the weight loss at six months and, um, and probably a lot of weight regain over time. And you get the um, associated fairly modest decrease in A1C with that degree of weight loss. Um, this data looks a lot like our anterior plication data that I'll show you later. Um, so this sort of suggests to me that maybe this fold wasn't created tight enough. You weren't getting the amount of volume restriction you needed. I think if you do this operation uh, as, as, um, as most people are doing it uh, with the right degree of restriction, you do get really robust weight loss in that first year, uh, and then you, see it, then you see a plateau, but usually you see a little bit more than this. So that may account for some of the results here. There's a study by Martin Fried out of uh, Czech Republic, and he looked at 244 patients, and I, I put this on here because it did specifically look at their diabetic patients, which comprised about 30% uh, of the population. They had a major complication rate of 1%, which is reasonable. Again, very early weight loss uh, results and uh, diabetic results. But they saw some improvement uh, in their diabetic patients. So 97% had either improvement or remission based on their criteria, and um, less uh, over 50% excess weight loss um, in the majority of patients at 18 months. So our initial experience with this procedure involved two different techniques. One was an anterior plication. You can see here where we simply, uh, we thought if we could reduce the volume of the stomach without having to take down the short gastrics and ex expose the patient to some risk of bleeding or uh, thermal injury there, we would uh, try to fold in the anterior stomach, create an anterior fold. Uh, as you can see, the laparoscopic and the uh, endoscopic image there and sort of the diagram. 
versus the greater curvature plication. These were non-randomized, these were consecutive patients, but then we went to the greater curvature plication, which you're familiar with the concept already. And you can see those folds are pretty durable, that six months and 12 months endoscopically, this, this fold remains, but there's still a lot of systemic volume there posteriorly that was not addressed. Whereas in the greater curvature plication, as you can see, the volume does get bigger over time, but the fold remains intact and in and, and a non-insufflated stomach. It remains as a space occupying uh, lesion within the, the stomach, which helps control satiety and, and uh, potentially hunger. So there was very early divergence. Again, very small numbers in this little pilot study we did, but uh, uh, pretty good weight loss in the greater curvature group, but not very good weight loss in the anterior group, which I suggest you just need, there's some threshold of gastric volume reduction that needs to be met in order to achieve the kind of weight loss that we're looking for uh, in our patients. So that led us to our, our next study, which is a multi-center trial, a three-center trial looking at one-year uh, one results. It was initially designed as a three-year study, but these are the one-year outcomes, and it was our, our center, uh, Martin Fried in Czech Republic and Brad Needleman at the um, uh, Ohio State University. And it was prospective, uh, three centers as I mentioned, and we just recruited patients from our general uh, population of bariatric surgery patients who were entering the programs, um, and we standardized the technique. We went to the pig lab, everyone did a couple on the porcine model, and we had a standard uh, technique that we attempted to reproduce across the study at the different sites. Uh, and then we just had pretty routine follow-up uh, out to a year on this particular data set. We enrolled 44 patients and uh, three withdrew their consent after the procedure and one was lost to follow-up. So that leaves 40 patients for the analysis. Fairly low BMI group of 42, not very many diabetics uh, and um, a fairly high percentage of hypertensive patients in this uh, study. And you can see here that uh, overall the procedure time was a little bit under two hours. Um, hospital stay was about two days. Most common problem we see and most people see with this operation is nausea, uh, which can be usually fairly short, uh, self-limited, but can be severe and last uh, weeks in some patients. Uh, but fairly high incidence of nausea and, and some vomiting. Uh, abdominal pain occurs in, most, in about half the patients uh, beyond what you would expect from the incisional pain. And then we had one gastric leak in this, uh, this trial that required a laparotomy, and this was a perforation up at the angle of his. Weight loss is uh, progressing out to about a year. As I mentioned earlier, you do see the uh, error bars getting a little bit wider as you move further away from the surgery. Uh, and you can see the excess weight loss there of about 43% across all three sites. And in addition to the weight loss uh, that we were seeing in this first year of the study, we had some improvements in HDL and uh, triglycerides uh, in this group of patients as well. It was interesting, we looked at weight loss outcomes and it was pretty evenly distributed between sites in terms of the number of patients, but <clears throat> clearly even though we tried to standardize the technique and we worked hard to, to practice this on the pig model uh, and do it all the same way, we're seeing variations in, in outcomes between sites. Uh, and it varies fairly widely between 48% excess weight loss and 38% excess weight loss. Um, so that probably speaks to differences even, even in techniques. Maybe it represents some differences in, in patient selection or patient behavior, but I think technique in this particular operation plays a huge role in how successful the outcomes are. We did some quality of life uh, instruments and saw generally improvement in quality of life for physical scores and overall uh, quality of life with this degree of weight loss. And I'll kind of wrap up here a little bit with just a, a brief um, a little rat study that really, um, this is the only mechanistic study I could find. We, we looked at uh, some gut hormones in this initial trial we did, but with the anterior plication mixed in with the greater curvature plication, we really couldn't make any sense of the data. It was kind of all over the map. And so we don't have a good handle on what's going on with ghrelin and some of these other gut hormones after plication. This is a rat study that's actually not that informative, but it was the only one I could find. It was sleeve, sleeve rats didn't have much change in anything in terms of gut hormones. Uh, and the plication rats did have a lower body uh, fat content and, and leptin levels compared to the control rats. Um, and the ghrelin was lower in the plication rats compared to the sham operated rats. But if you think about what's going on with ghrelin in this operation, uh, you're devascularizing the fundus, uh, so that may play a role. Uh, you're folding it in, you're not resecting it. So it's, I think it's really an unknown at this point in terms of what's going on with ghrelin and whether gastric transit is increased, as we see with the sleeve gastrectomy producing some hindgut effect. Again, that uh, certainly remains to be seen. 
So in conclusion, uh, the greater curve appears to be an effective emerging bariatric procedure for the treatment of obesity. There's a lot of variation in techniques that need to be addressed, uh, especially when we look at these different studies and we see wide variation in the results. We have to wonder about the techniques being used uh, to achieve consistent results. Uh, I think we need to try to standardize this as much as possible. Uh, the longer term outcomes are needed and to assess its potential and its risk profile. It's not a risk-free operation. There's leaks, there are gastric prolapses through these sutures, there are mechanical complications with this operation. And um, we, you know, before we can really call this a, a standard procedure and recognize it as a metabolic procedure, we need to be uh, carefully studying the mechanism, mechanisms of action uh, of this operation, which has not been done. So uh, this uh, procedure remains investigational, should be done under IRB uh, protocol, and uh, patients need to be informed that we don't have good long-term data uh, when they choose to have this operation done. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stacy. Uh, I'd like to remind the audience, please fill out the evaluation um, so that we know. Stay up. You've got five minutes to answer questions and get grilled. So there are four, spe four, uh, four microphones up. When you do address, please state your name and where you're, where you're from. So my name is Alphonse Pomp, and I'm from Cornell, and I, I have a question for you. If 50% if of the patients have inadequate weight loss, um, you're going to do some revisions on this type of operation. And, and what are you going to revise them to? And if you're going to use a stapler, how are you going to come across any of this stuff? Because it's hard enough to do two layers. Um, how are you going to come across four layers? All right, it's a great, great question. We've revised some in our institution, some of our folks that have failed to maintain their weight loss. Uh, I know of others anecdotally who have done revisions on, uh, you know, potentially this is one of the advantages of this operation is if you don't have a good outcome, it's revisable, uh, but it's still revisional surgery. And that, the way we've dealt with it, I've done, I've revised an anterior plication to a bypass and, and a greater curve plication to a bypass. Uh, Dr. Showers converted a, a greater curve plication to a sleeve. Um, and in these initial studies, the ones that we've revised, we'd used proline suture. And um, it was actually not that daunting to cut the sutures and peel apart some of these little uh, serosal attachments and really restore the greater curvature. Uh, the anterior application, I would say, actually was a little more difficult because we had to sort of unfold it anteriorly and really restore that surface, anterior surface of the stomach uh, before we made our pouch. But um, I, I, felt, I found both of those to be you know, reasonable in terms of uh, technical difficulty and, and the patients did fine. We were able to make a normal size gastric pouch. I would not recommend trying to, f you know, you're asking way too much of your stapler to go across that fold. So I think you have to undo the fold or you have to be, if you're gonna do a sleeve, you have to be very confident that enough of that fold is disrupted or can be stretched out that you're firing that stapler across two layers of stomach and that may con you know, require endoscopic confirmation. But I would not fire across that entire fold. If there's anybody too shy to go to a, a microphone, you can SMS uh, or text message. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm Dr. Ali Farnoon from uh, United Arab Emirates. You're going to have to speak a lot louder. Okay, uh, Dr. Ali Farnoon from United Arab Emirates, Emirates International Hospital. Uh, I am doing uh, gastric plications. Uh, already I have done uh, 150 cases. Uh, the case that about the weight loss, my results are 63, 64, after one year. I have follow-up of two uh, years and a half. Uh, the thing about revisional, I want to uh, answer this question, uh, not ask it. The uh, Dr. Talipur and others, uh, Dr. Uh, Ariel Ortiz or uh, Almino Ramos and many others, they are doing, uh, for revisional uh, gastric application, the, uh, if you can do it, uh, uh, replicate, it is a safe method, and it will reduce weight again. Uh, the, to risk leave, it is okay, it is an option. Even a bypass is an option. But uh, you think first about gastric plication, replicate again, and, and you'll have good results. So the question so. I think is replicating yeah, for I weight think loss. So too. Yeah. yeah, so I, I, I suppose, uh, I, I, personally, I wouldn't. I, I'm, this is an, I consider it an investigational operation. If they fail it, I'm not going to go do another investigational operation. I'm gonna to go to something I trust will work well for them. Um, if, you know, I guess theoretically, if they've had a great response and for whatever technical reason their plication has come apart and that's all they were interested in, you know, I guess theoretically that could be an option, but um, that's not how I would approach it. I would do a standard procedure. Okay, thanks, thanks. Dave. Don't go too far. <laughs> <laughs>